And there's there's actually going to be one thing I sort of park on uh, for the most part. I mean, we'll, we'll hit more than one thing, but believe it or not, we're going to get into the tattoo question. Uh, this is a question I actually have gotten an email several times uh, about what I think about tattooing, and people always take you to Leviticus. And there was something in in uh, Leviticus 19. Uh, that I could have brought up then and gone into the tattooing thing, but there was plenty to cover in the in that previous episode. So I'm going to pick it up here because there's something in Leviticus 21 that references back to Leviticus 19. So this will be the episode. We can talk about that. So uh, having said that, let's just jump in here to Leviticus 21 and start reading. We'll pick up a few things and work our way to the, to the uh, sort of centerpiece for the episode. So Leviticus 21 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron and say to them, no one shall make himself unclean for the dead among his people, except for his closest relatives, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, or his virgin sister who is near to him because she had no husband. For her, he may make himself unclean. Now, this... Let us just throw in the fourth verse. He he shall not make himself unclean as a husband among his people and so profane himself. Now, these first four verses are about whether they're essentially about, okay, since contact with the dead makes you unclean. We talked about this earlier in Leviticus, whether it's a a dead human being, a dead carcass of an animal, contact with death or with the dead makes a person ritually unclean, which again is unfit for sacred space. And so in this chapter, the the issue comes up, well, what about the priests? Uh, Because the priests, you know, are, are in some way responsible ritually with Again, sanctifying people in this situation, they're invariably going to be in contact with uh, the dead because, again, of the distress of someone dying. And, you know, they, they may ask a priest to come over and, you know, comfort them or do this or that. So so there, there's... They're in need of some special commentary for, you know, what happens with, with the priests. And, and what we have here in the first four verses gets us into, in, initially, uh, the the ordinary priest. In other words, the first four verses here are dealing with just your, your run-of-the-mill priest, not the high priest. The high priest is going to come later and have even stricter rules. But in the first four verses here, we get the parameters for whether a priest can willingly okay, make himself unclean with respect to contact with a dead relative. And Again, there's a, there's a list of, of what's allowable here. There, there's a similar verse in Ezekiel 44 that says, this is verse 25, Ezekiel 44, 25. A priest shall not defile himself by entering a house where there is a dead person. Again, because you're a priest, you know, you you have your job is to occupy sacred space and do things. So, you know, you shouldn't just go into this situation where you could be defiled, Okay. But the exception occurs again in Ezekiel 44. The rest of the verse says, he shall defile himself only for the sake of father or mother, son or daughter, brother or unmarried sister. So it it mimics the situation here that we just read in Leviticus 21. So if we go back to that in the very first verse, no one shall make himself, again, speak to the priests, no one shall make himself unclean for the dead among his people. Okay, the word Hebrew uh, for people is on. Um, which again can be an entire people group, an entire nation, or more limited group. And here, in, in this context, it's obviously a reference to somebody's near kin. And so, the the principle laid down is generally priests should not go into homes where there's a dead person. Okay, you're just going to be defiled, and and your job is in sacred space. So then, you know that that's going to just mess things up. But for the ordinary priest, if it's father, mother, son, daughter, brother, unmarried, sister, okay. It's okay to enter that house, comfort people, um, you know, whereas before this is something you shouldn't do, even though people might want you to do, or you might, again, you might think your duty as a priest, you know, might uh, involve this. Don't defile yourself by contacting the dead. Don't enter a house where there's a dead person, except you know, in these this this situation, this narrow group. So as a general rule, an ordinary priest should not become defiled by contact with the dead, even of his own extended clan, but only for the members of his clan who are the most closely related to him, and again, his immediate family. So it, it's an issue because attending the burial of clan relatives was sort of a traditional th- thing to do in, in the culture. But the priests here are actually a little bit restricted from doing that. They, they can only do that in certain situations. So right away, again, we're, we're starting off 
I think it was important to mention that because Leviticus 21 very clearly, again, is in a context of priestly duties, sacred space, again, something religious. Let's just be as broad as we possibly can. There's a religious context to what we're reading now in Leviticus 21. Uh, and, and if we want to use the word a ritual context, a priestly context, so whatever whatever the vocabulary is we want to use. Now, that that becomes an important setup. It helps us, again, get the flow of things for when we hit verse 5. Leviticus 21.5 says, they, again, the priests, because that, that's who he's talking to, speak to the priests in verse 1. They shall not make bald patches on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts on their body. Now, this is a verse that typically comes up with the tattooing situation. So right away, the context for this is, we're talking about priests here. We're not talking about anybody in general. We're talking about priests. That's that's the first thing. But this comment in Leviticus 21.5, notice what's grouped here. Make bald patches on the heads, shave off the edge of the beards, or make any cuts on their body. Now that harkens back to Leviticus 19. And I didn't bring this up in the previous episode, but we'll, we'll pick it up here. Let's just get a few verses, you know, the, the, the cluster of verses here. And you can see where the same kind of language, the, the how, where it falls into here. In Leviticus 19, 26 to 29 says this, You shall not eat any, eat any flesh with the blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. You shall not round off the hair on your temples, nor mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or or tattoo yourselves. This is the ESV. Uh, I am the Lord. Do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute, lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full of depravity. Okay, so this, it, it's grouped in here with a bunch of other rules. And the eating of the flesh, again, the, the, the blood of an animal was only, you know, blood of a sacrifice was only for God. Blood was really only for God. We talked about how, you know, you, people would have to bury it, put dirt over it so that it couldn't be used in ritual purpose. We talked about that in the last episode. The life force belongs to God. It goes back to God. That's not the idea. That's why you shouldn't consume blood. It, then we go from that to interpreting omens or telling fortunes. Again, treading on the area of divine knowledge, sacred space, really the other world, the spiritual world, you know, contacting beings who inhabit that world to get special divine information. You're not supposed to do that. And we talked about that a little bit last time, what the logic is. And then we get right after that, Leviticus 19. Don't round the hair off your temples or mar the edges of your beard. Don't make cuts on your body or tattoo yourselves. Okay, and then we go to profane your daughter by making her a prostitute. Again, most a lot of scholars think that refers to sacred prostitution. In other words, you don't you don't have your your, your daughter function as a cultic prostitute. I mean, generally a prostitute would, would be bad too, but since this is in the context of this other religious stuff, again, this is an oblique reference to sort of idolatry, some of the things that the Canaanites did. Yeah, and I want you to get the flavor that this is not just so so broad and wide. There, there is a religious reason. There's a religious flavor, a context for these laws that has something to do with your your vow, your your status as the people of Yahweh to have only Him as your God. There are certain things you do not do religiously because the Canaanites do that. The Egyptians do this stuff. You know, fill in the blank. Somebody else does this. Someone else who's loyal to another God does these things. And as we're going to see here with the quote tattoo question, there's a consistent, again, ritualistic religious flavor to these commands in Leviticus. So let's just jump in here full bore, you know, with this this whole question. So the I'd start by saying this again, just to make the, the point again, the context of Leviticus 19 and here we're in Leviticus 21. So 21 verse 5, I think is pretty clear. The practices listed are all associated in some way with religious practices practiced by pagans. Okay, there's there's this there's this context. We don't do this in you know, as a follower of Yahweh. We don't do this as a priest of Yahweh because people who have other gods and worship them and do certain rituals for them do these things. We're not going to do them. They do. We are, again, maintaining a, 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 you know, a separation between us and them because of our loyalty to, to Yahweh of Israel over against other gods. So the practices listed here are all associated in some way with, with other religions, idolatrous rites. And Everything listed here was well known in the ancient world as having 
that context, having something to do with, again, what, what an Israelite would look at and say is an idolatrous ritual, some divination practice or some ritual conducted. And that's, again, at the heart of why these things are prohibited. So if you go to Leviticus 19, you go through the list, consumption of blood. Again, we talked about that. You don't use blood ritualistically. Blood belongs to Yahweh because it's a life force. Well, other, you know, other pagan religions, they did lots of things with blood, you know, to to their gods, that, that sort of thing. So again, the, the law wants to hem that in, maintain loyalty to Yahweh. Don't consume the blood. You know, don't, don't do what these other people do. Then there was interpreting omens, telling fortunes, again, soliciting divine knowledge from other, other gods other spirit spirit beings, and then again, rounding off the hair and the beard. Now, as odd as it might sound, in the ancient Near East, hair, as well as blood, as well as semen, some of these other things, symbolized life force. And, and it did so because it grew. It was perceived as being alive because it grows, just like a plant, all right? So consequently, people who occupied sacred space, in other words, priests, were not to cut their hair or their beard short. This is one of the, 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 the bits of logic, part of the rationale that goes into this. It's kind of interesting, but locks of hair have been found, and there are ancient texts outside the Bible that describe the practice, but lots hair has been found laid in tombs, put on funeral pyres, again, in ancient Syria, you know, some of these other archaeological sites. Uh, hair is described as being brought to sanctuaries, temples as part of dedicatory offerings to some god. Again, it, it was, again, just because of the way it was perceived. And again, you know, we, we have a religious context. Now, for